For Pacifica Radio, December 22nd, 2022, I'm Scott Horton. This is Anti-War Radio. All right, y'all, welcome to the show. It is Anti-War Radio. I'm your host, Scott Horton. I'm editorial director of Antiwar.com and editor of the new book, Hotter Than the Sun, Time to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. You can find my full interview archive, more than 5,800 of them now, going back to 2003, at scotthorton.org and at youtube.com slash scotthortonshow. And you can follow me on Twitter, at scotthortonshow. All right, before we get into the interviews today, I want to tell you guys about this anti-war protest we're holding on February the 19th in Washington, D.C. I know that's on the other side of the country from L.A., but it's just a few hundred bucks away. And it's called Rage Against the War Machine. It's going to be at the Lincoln Memorial. And the thing is hosted by the Libertarian Party and the People's Party in alliance. I'm speaking there. So is Medea Benjamin and Jimmy Dore. And a bunch of other great people were working on trying to get Roger Waters, I think, and others. So please come on out, help make the thing a spectacle, help make it matter. It's rageagainstwar.com to find out more information. Rage Against the War Machine, Anti-War Rally, Washington, D.C., February the 19th. Rageagainstwar.com. All right, you guys, and our next guest today is the great Kelly Bokar Vlejos. She is the editor of Responsible Statecraft, the article website of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft in Washington. Hi, Kelly. Welcome back to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you, Scott. I'm so happy to have you on the show here and a lot of important stuff to talk about. We just kind of went over some developments in the war with Connor Freeman from antiwar.com. So I figure we'll focus more on the politics in the United States with you. Vladimir Zelensky came and gave an address to the U.S. Congress last night. What's going on? Well, it sounded like that that trip was well in the works, I guess, for months. Uh, So it wasn't as, as much of a surprise as we were led to believe. I think in the matter of the aid, the $45 billion uh, that has been allocated for Ukraine aid goes, it's going to pass as of this recording. Uh, it looks like the, the Congress is, is poised to pass the omnibus bill that they need to to keep the government going. And in that is that massive new Ukraine aid package. And so this will bring... Ukraine aid to, I believe, $113 billion for 2022. Not all of that, of course, is military aid. But in this last package, more than half of that $45 billion is military related, either directly to Ukraine or to replenish the stockpiles that have been so depleted over the last year, the U.S. stockpiles. So we're talking big amounts of money and assistance continuing, though it was interesting that the that Biden had really pushed back last night in his press conference with Zelensky that he is standing firm against giving Ukraine any more or any offensive more sophisticated advanced weapons. They want to hold the line on defensive weapons. But to me, Scott, we seem committed to keeping this war of attrition going. So to me saying, oh, well, we're going to stop at offensive weapons. I mean, that's good because I really feel like that would escalate into World War III. But I feel like the billions of dollars we're giving them in new weapons every day, every week, is just going to keep that grind going at the expense of millions of Ukrainian lives. Yeah. Well, and I mean, when they're talking about we demand fighter jets— and this kind of thing, that's mm-hmm. obvious to everyone that that would escalate right into war. And as we were just talking about with Connor Freeman, they're already, as uh, the London Times explained, it was on an explicit green light from the American Pentagon that the Ukrainians launched these drone attacks on a Russian air base more than 300 or however many miles inside Russia. 
including damaged nuclear-capable heavy bombers. This is the kind of thing that could escalate into a war between Russia and NATO at any time. Right. So best case scenario, there's a negotiated end to the war right now or the Ukrainians just win. Putin turns around and goes home with his tail between his legs or some kind of thing. What's going to be the future of America's relationship with Russia after this? How could we ever get it back to where we want it, which is at least the friendliness of the 90s, if not the policies of the 90s, you know? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, to me, and not knowing what's going on behind the scenes. So, you know, a generous take would be, okay, behind the scenes, there is diplomacy going on. And then perhaps Biden, when speaking with Zelensky in private at the White House, talked a little bit about how to start moving both sides, Russia and Ukraine, towards the table to talk and to finally put an end to this war. But forward facing, all that was said yesterday was that the United States remains committed to helping Ukraine defeat Russia. And like you said, that that may not mean overtly giving them offensive weapons, but if we are covertly helping them target Russia in Russia, I don't know how that doesn't escalate. So I would like to see a little bit more of the diplomacy part of this puzzle, which I didn't see a lot of that in the, during this visit. I didn't see a, I feel a lot of signals there. And I, I believe that needs to happen. Now, the only pushback that we actually saw yesterday was from Republicans and populist sources on, on Twitter and Tucker Carlson, who were really uh, banging the drum against the unaudited, you know, blank check aid that we're giving Zelensky. That's the only pushback that I've I've seen so far. Now, whether that's politically motivated and charged, whatever, um, but they, the Republicans, or this small slice of Republicans, but very vocal slice, are the only, only ones calling for some breaks on this sort of avalanche of aid, U.S. taxpayer dollars that are going over to Ukraine for this war. Sorry, hang on just one second. Hey, y'all, Scott Horton here for Tennessee Hot Sauce Company. Man, this stuff is so good. They get all different flavors. Garlic habanero, honey habanero, pineapple habanero, poblano jalapeno, and the blood orange ghost. They're all so good, I swear. And for a limited time, Tennessee Hot Sauce Company is featuring official Scott Horton Hotter Than the Sun thermonuclear hot sauce. It's full of Carolina Reapers, Scorpion Peppers, Dr. Pepper, Hydrogen Isotopes, and all kinds of things that'll burn your tongue clean off. Seriously, it's really good. Get yourself a hot sauce subscription. Spend $40 or more and use promo code SCOTT to get a free bottle of Hotter Than The Sun hot sauce. That's tnhotsauceco.com. Hey, y'all gotta check out these awesome busts of our hero, the great Ron Paul. They're made by the renowned sculptor Rick Casali. They're 13 inches tall, hand-painted bronze resin based on Casale's brilliant original. Y'all may have seen mine in the background on my bookshelf in some recent interviews. The thing is unbelievable. Check out this incredible piece of art at rickcasale.com slash ronpaul and you'll see what I mean. Use promo code Horton and you'll save 25 bucks. And this show will get a little kickback too. That's rickcasale.com slash ronpaul. Casale is C-A-S-A-L-I rickcasali.com slash Ron Paul. And there's free shipping too. And you know, you do have just like in Libya and in Yemen, you have this, uh, what the Obama people call leading from behind where it's almost like a lynch mob where they diffuse responsibility. So where, you know, okay, yes, we technically are committing genocide in Yemen, but really it's just the Saudis and the UAE who are doing it and we're only helping them do it. And so it's, Sort of their fault, not ours. And it's the same kind of thing here. We go, oh, look, we'll give you all of these missiles and all these weapons and all this training and all of this money. But like, hey, 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 it's their war. We can't tell them whether they should try to invade Crimea or not. That's purely up to them to decide. Yeah. Well, geez, I don't know. And the same kind of thing here where, if anything, we're giving them, uh, according to the London Times, I think quite credibly, a green light. You know, hey, hey, we're not stopping you from attacking inside Russia. Never you mind Crimea or the newly annexed, supposedly annexed territories of eastern Ukraine, but inside Russia itself. And we're just telling them, go right ahead. That's almost yeah. certainly bound to 
lead to further escalation. And by the way, I guess part of the context here, too, is whether this actually happens or not is uncertain. It's the future. But, you know, all the credible reporting, Kelly, right, is that the Russians are preparing a massive winter mm -hmm. offensive that could start at any time here. And so, yeah, that, that that always bothered me with the talk that I've been hearing over the last week, in particular yesterday, that Ukraine has won, that they stopped Putin, that, you know, Zelensky said, we are no longer under the tyranny or control of Putin. You know, realistically, let's look at what's going on on the ground there. And I'm sure you talked to, to Connor quite a bit about that. To me, they're getting pummeled by missiles and shelling every day. We have this the threat of this massive invasion or this massive rather um, offensive in the works. You know, they, their infrastructure is so crippled at the height of the, the winter. I mean, I'm not seeing a lot of winning going on. And I feel like I know that that is to keep morale up and to have some sort of psyops against Russia. But I also think that it could be a little bit delusional and unrealistic when we're looking at what's actually going on the ground and there's not a lot of winning going on. And I feel like if Ukrainians feel like they are winning, they're of course they're gonna want more US weapons because victory is right around the corner and it'll be at the expense of really destroying that country and everybody in, in it. Yeah, I thought it was so telling when after the Ukrainians took back her son that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he said, look, you boys have done a real good job. You took back Kherson. Think maybe you should talk now. Yeah. Which I inferred to mean that, look, you're going to lose Mary Paul. In fact, I believe it was NBC News. Oh, it was. It was It was uh, Andrea Mitchell, Alan Greenspan's wife, was uh, reporting, and her reporter was saying on her show that Biden is telling Zelensky, listen, man, you know you're going to have to negotiate now. That, mm. you know, outward appearances are that, you know, total victory is at hand. But in reality, we're telling them, dude, you're going to have to negotiate. Which means what? Like, it's, to me, the obvious inference is you're going to lose Donetsk. And you're going to lose at least half of Luhansk. And you're going to lose Mariupol. And you'd be lucky if you get Zaprosia and Kursan out of the deal. And let's quit while we're behind, but not too far behind. That was months ago. And here he got shouted down at least months worth here. They're asking for more weapons. And as you're saying, yeah. doubling down under the premise that it's working. And it looks like, you know, even the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is saying, guys, we really should be winding this thing down before it gets worse for our side. Yeah, exactly. And I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm not a diplomat. I'm not trained in, in these particular arts. And I, I realize that, you know, Twitter is probably not the best way or social media overall is not the best way to like roll out your diplomatic plan. But if, if there are these diplomatic channels uh, being pursued behind the scenes, great. But I do feel like the signals that I was reading last night in the speech, the reaction to the speech, the, the, the press conference was all that we aren't going to force Ukraine to the table or to talk. When they're ready to talk, they'll talk. In the meantime, we're committed to defeating Russia. And we're backing that up with billions and billions of dollars in weapons. So I, I just don't know. I feel like this is, um, this is like having it both ways. And perhaps I just don't know enough about diplomacy um, and I'm missing something, but I just, I don't think this is, I don't think this is healthy. Yeah. I'm going to err on the side of you're not making an error here, Kelly. <laughs> I, I've seen them in action and I've seen you. I don't, I don't understand how anyone in the world thinks that there's anything more important than trying to get a ceasefire in this war on Russia's border. It's the most dangerous thing to happen probably since the second world war. Mm -hmm. And you know, what we're on the precipice of. And look, it's not that there's a very great risk of nuclear war, right? It's just that there is a heightened one and the consequences. And look, it could happen today. The Russians could get a blip on their computer screen and misunderstand it and yep. think that they're under attack. You know, that yep. kind of thing happens all the time. When yeah, it happens exactly. at a time of tension like this, a mistake like that could lead or, or a misunderstanding of diplomatic language or, or of military action or even just a severe enough provocation could mm -hmm. lead to annihilation. Exactly. Um, 
Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what 2023 brings. And we'll have a new a new uh, complexion in, in Congress, although Mitch McConnell, you know, in the Senate had taken a lot of heat from Republicans who are against this aid for saying yesterday or the day before that uh, our number one priority as a country is defeating Russia. Yeah. So I, I do think that there were, there is going to be a, a political battle as much as there'll be literal battle on the ground in, in Ukraine. And, and I don't know which way it'll go, Scott, but I'm, I'm hoping for some real open debate about this aid. It doesn't have to be, um, I don't, I don't care to, you know, take, take pot shots at Zelensky. He's doing what he's got to do for his country. But I think as an American, I would like to see more of a healthy open debate on how our taxpayer dollars are being spent in this war. And not because I want it for something else, because I'm not sure this is the morally correct thing to do for Ukraine. Yeah. All right, you guys, that is the great Kelly B. Vallejos. She is the editor of Responsible Statecraft at responsiblestatecraft.org. So please check her out there, responsiblestatecraft.org. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. And that's it for Anti-War Radio for today. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I'm Scott Horton. Find the full archive at scotthorton.org. And I'm here every Thursday from 2.30 to 3 on KPFK 90.7 FM in L.A. See you next week.